the, the media, social media, et cetera, as we said, as well as urban um, stimuli is responsible for the increasing numbers of people struggling with clusters of symptoms that we call depression, anxiety, even psychosis, uh, ADHD. Um, that this that it, there's an overall traumatic effect of this overwhelm that no one's talking about. Hello, and welcome to Self Talk. I'm your host, Rachel Astarte. Today, my guest is Kent Weishaus. He's had a 25-year career in television production, working on talk shows, game shows, tabloids, sitcoms, and other programming before making a switch in 2006, going back to graduate school and becoming a licensed clinical social worker. Since then, he has worked in mental hospitals, in community clinics, schools, and now he's semi-retired, continuing a part-time private practice. Kent is also the author of Stop Breaking Down, How to Avoid Overwhelm and Crack Up, something we all need, especially these days. Kent, welcome to Self Talk. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you. So uh, we got a little bit of your background in the um, in the intro, but how how does how does someone make a switch from a career in television production to clinical social work? How did you do it? <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a long process. It took it pro probably was a decade of processing, uh, cognitive processing. Um, I, I was working on uh, actually my thoughts in this direction came while I was working on the Arsenio Hall show as associate producer. And um, whereas I was happy with my work on Arsenio by and large um, with our work, um, it just it became more and more evident to me that certain television programming uh, more on the tabloid end um, was exploitive, uh, exploitative, um, it really, it's designed to sell sponsors products. And um, and so at that time, I think I read a book called uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Uh, I can't remember the author's name, but it uh, kind of jangled my brain and uh, said, maybe you should be thinking about a different different direction. And so my parents were both therapists. So I thought, hmm, well, maybe I've gone a long way out of my way to come back a short distance correctly. So uh, so uh, in 2006, I uh, went back to grad school and uh, got my MSW and uh, a couple of years later was licensed as licensed clinical social worker in California. And uh, and I haven't really looked back, although I actually have been called here and there to um, like I, I did a stage managing gig on the Academy of Country Music Awards after I'd gotten my my master's. So uh, anyway, now and then things come up. Yeah, are there are there any parallels you see between producing and doing therapeutic work? Yeah, um, I, a lot of my work as a producer, especially, was peacekeeping and moderating um between disagreeing parties um uh, i also uh, worked for a man uh named milt hoffman for a number of years who he'd been around since um radio days producing and um and he tended to have uh black a little black and white thinking here and there and would 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 heat up very quickly and so i would moderate between him and and the rest of the crew, <laughs> not a lot, but but sometimes uh, he was also a very knowledgeable and thoughtful guy. I don't want to paint him into a corner that way. So, yeah. So a lot of a lot of moderating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Talking, um, and and talking people off the ledge. <laughs> right. Well, also, you know, just just hiring people. Um, I can remember a few dozen times getting on the phone saying, "Would you come do this special that we're doing?" Uh, to you know, a couple of dozen different crew, crew members, and invariably you're offering them a dollar or two less than they want to be making, and so uh, 
it's also another reason why why I kind of wanted to get away was on specials, especially you, you are going after a slightly lower rate and uh, and someone is kind of having to take that um, and they don't like it um, unless it's somebody you absolutely want. You're probably not going to pay the full rate and and oh, just do this for me this time. And next time it'll be the, the real rate. And, and it's just duplicitous. So it wasn't really it didn't feel that good. Yeah. Yeah. So as you moved into uh, clinical social work, what are some themes that you saw coming up with the people that you worked with? What were some of the issues that you saw um, your clients coming to you to work on? The, um, sorry, my my phone is uh, making noise here and I, I have to turn it off. Um, uh, yeah, my clients, initially, I was working with a, uh, with mainly kids. Um, and, uh, well, no, that's not entirely true. I, I was with kids in a certain clinic uh, in South LA, while I was interning, uh, and um, accumulating hours for licensure. And I also was, uh, so that's one population. And another population uh, was psychiatric hospitals, as you mentioned in my intro. Um, I worked at two of those. And um, so very different, obviously, but um, the themes, you know, then and now, uh, there's a big overviewing theme of how do we cope in a society that uh, is designed in many ways to make us dysfunctional, um, that um, we've got income disparity, um, great wealth disparity. Um, how do we cope with that? Um, and so uh, I was also a adjunct professor at Cal State LA uh, for four or five years um, after I got my license. And, uh, and I, I would tell my clients, my students, um, be aware that you will many times be uh, where the rubber meets the road of bad policy. <laughs> and um, and so, like, how are you going to help people cope while you're there to gently enforce a policy which is designed uh, in many ways to um, to marginalize and keep people uh in, in, in struggling mm, yeah how how does one do that well um uh, you know it's not that you're aware of it in the moment while you're working with people as you know as a therapist you join them hopefully um you 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 join them where they're at but I think it's important, and I speak about this a lot in my book, it's important to keep in mind the many systems around us uh, that are that we're involved in, that we're embedded in, that we don't even see that we're in. And and systems that um as 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 we said earlier, um the idea as you mentioned earlier to me before we got on, the the societal beliefs where that that affect individual beliefs um we have uh great umbrellas of ideas raining down on us um and uh narratives raining down on us that we internalize and it's very easy to uh, come to feel either that i'm less than that I'm that because I'm struggling with functioning I'm marginalized because I've been given a label of a diagnostic label, um, I am that label, you know? Um, and uh, so it, it, I gently try and point out the systems, you know, I get that that label may be useful in certain ways, but also maybe these are things you're struggling with right now, mm -hmm. but tomorrow you may not be. Um, tomorrow you may be moving on to something completely different and in a higher functioning way. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I also feel that we as clinicians get trapped into the narratives that come along with the diagnostic labels. And, you know, it's, it's nice to talk about clusters of symptoms that you see in groups of people that 
share a commonality. Um, but it's easy to fall into the trap, uh, especially in psychiatric hospitals. Oh, you know, uh, the 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 psychotic in 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 the the game room down there, you know, uh, it's like colleagues putting a label, you know, the depressive and such down the hall. Um, it's just not useful. Um, uh, I think it's more counter counterproductive than productive. Um, I don't know. Did I get off on a tangent there? <laughs> no, perfect. In fact, it, it, this was where I was was heading. So we have these these societal uh, expectations or rules, if you will, uh, societal norms that may or may not be uh, beneficial to us as individuals as we move along our psycho-spiritual path um, and of, of awareness and of self-awareness and awareness of the world around us. And what you said, and I want to circle back to this because my clients are going to go, uh-oh, this is her thing, <laughs> is... Uh, one of the reasons I don't take insurance is because I don't want to have to diagnose someone for the very right. reason you just mentioned. Right. It is it, We have enough labels and roles that are foisted upon us from the moment we're born. Uh, Absolutely so, right. And then it's almost like I think of an armadillo, right? Like all these little layers and, you know, of things that stop us from being our, our true nature. Right. And in order to get, and this is Jung's individuation, in order to get along in the world, we have to start like questioning those scales, you know, that are there. And, and that's a really long and sometimes difficult process. And it doesn't help if you've been told, I'm bipolar. That's right. That's, that's right. who if I you, am. If you're embedded in these systems that rain beliefs down on you, um, they, they you internalize many of them. And um and yes, it does not help. Um, I, to, I, the idea of thinking about your thinking and uh, Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel winning uh, psychologist, um, talks about system one and system two thinking, system one thinking being uh, very quick uh, mammalian danger or not thinking, system two being uh, literally thinking about thinking. And he uh has a an that's kind of an acronym um what you see is what there is um and and what there is being the operative words like will always be this way what i'm seeing right now will all we tend to be grounded in the here and now and it, so it's really important to remind yourself no this is happening right now but an hour from now it's going to be very different you know um and and so um, think about your thinking. Think about the systems you're embedded in. Think about what others' beliefs are, uh, uh, how they're affecting you, how they're raining down on you. Um, I also, uh, in my book, uh, talk a lot about just the um, historical, the developmental, the uh, evolutionary, evolutionary nature of our behaviors. It's only uh, we're living in a in a culture you know where we're expected to keep up with a rapid fire uh social media media uh narratives that are just bombarding us not to mention if you live in an urban area you're surrounded by cars going by at 60 miles an hour and a lot of them and and helicopters and noise and 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 perhaps because of our social systems um people who uh, are not grounded in the same reality as we are on the corner talking to someone who's not there um, and so we are expected to process this stuff. And if you think about it, really, it's just been the last five or so generations um, that this has been building up because 150 years ago, um, the awful uh, images that we we see on our phones just by flipping through um, were extremely rare. You just didn't see those things unless you were in a war zone. Um uh, or, or, or you know, were the extreme outlier victim of crime, um, and so, uh, so it's important that you know when we see these images on our phone and we feel this is, this is, here now and always to be here and right next door. Um, no, it's across the planet, and it, it's perfectly valid to 
be concerned about it, but also understand that your mammalian systems of alarm and danger are being triggered by this. And they never were to this extent five generations ago. Hi, it's Rachel here. If you'd like to dive deeper into your own self-development, but you're looking for an alternative to traditional talk therapy, I think you'll love the Foundation of Self Immersion program. For a full year, you'll get dynamic coursework you can complete on your own time, plus weekly coaching calls and monthly one-on-one sessions with me for personal support. Visit foundationofself.com and click on the events page for more information. That's foundationofself.com. Now, back to the episode. Yeah. Yeah, and so, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but let's throw it around. Why? Why now? Why are we being bombarded with all of this fear? And it's well, what it is. It's generating It's generating the, the fight or flight, and, and we're constantly, even the weather, Right. You and I were just talking about the weather. (laughs) Everything is the storm of the century. Everything is clear out the shelves from the grocery store because this is it, folks. Right. You know, everything's freaking apocalyptic. Why? Yeah. No, because it sells more of the sponsor's product. Um, Having been in that business, I can tell you. (laughs) Um, You know, you're absolutely right. I, I pick up the newspaper. And it says a new atmospheric river is coming in, you know, over the Bay Area. Solar (laughs) flares. Right. And it's like, whatever happened to a thunderstorm is coming in, you know? (laughs) Um, It's like everything is a doomsday scenario. Right. And and having worked, the end of my TV career was largely in tabloid or at least exploitative programming. And I can tell you that um that style has now permeated you know, that was the late 90s or the, yeah the late 90s that style has now permeated most of media and, and including a lot of uh a lot of what i would call progressive media um latch on to it as well um the idea that uh I've been certainly uh conservative reactionary media is beating the drum on it um the idea that this awful thing is happening right now and it's always going to be happening to you um uh so in in television you sell more of the sponsors products by 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 doing it if you're a tabloid show and now it's permeated as i said mainstream news and so on um so uh why you asked why i think that's largely the reason and also the algorithms on our social media tend to bring this stuff up it's like um i think they're indirectly spell- selling the sponsors products which is probably just buy more of our of our website um uh or our app um so so yeah uh, unfortunately and and also uh you know there is that that part of us that when we see a accident on the expressway the freeway we slow down and look at it you know <laughs> um oh i have to look at that um and it's like but if it, you know if that wasn't in front of you every 30 seconds with the flip of your phone uh i suspect our lives would be a lot a lot more balanced and 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 i i also think that the the media social media etc as we said as well as urban um stimuli is responsible for the increasing numbers of people struggling with clusters of symptoms that we call depression anxiety even psychosis uh adhd um, that this that it, there's an overall traumatic effect of this overwhelm that no one's talking about. Yeah, yeah, very, very few people. I think they're only just starting to talk about it, and we're also starting to talk about uh, intergenerational trauma, collective trauma. Thomas Hubel is doing a lot of work with collective trauma now. So let's talk about that for a second. These societal beliefs, or where where we are, what's being fed to us from the media, and and um, even just conversations in one's community, which are, sure. of course, still, you know, our our global community is getting smaller and smaller, as you mentioned, like we may see on our phone atrocities that are happening thousands of miles away. We still feel it because we're human, right? right. We're not supposed to not feel it. Um, but how these societal beliefs, and let's just say, let's just lean into that. Let's keep y'all in a state of fear. <laughs> so that we can control you. 
how how that affects individual consciousness, but also collective consciousness. What are we looking at, Kent? <laughs> collective consciousness. Good idea. Good uh, good thought. Um, well, I think it's important to find ways to to soothe your own activated or wounded parts to pull pull away i'm not saying drop out i'm saying spend time away from it um doing things that are soothing to you that remind you that you're a valid individual um, who does deserve to be able to uh, take time to, uh, you know, be meditative, spiritual, uh, study things that are important to you that are not um, awful, horrific things. Um, I don't know. Am I answering your question? <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, the... the um, there's lots of different things that people can do. Um, as you said, you don't take insurance, which I admire. Um, <laughs> the uh, Because insurance and uh, many psych psychological uh, organizations, at least uh, government ones, tend to subscribe to a cookie cutter, cookie cutter form of intervention. Um, we have this intervention which has been statistically proven to be more valid than these other ones and so you must use it yes. um, and, and and so what happens then when you don't trust the the uh the abilities of the clinician to make a clinical decision as to what's best for the client what happens then is you figure out ways to get around that okay well i've got to use this paradigm how can i use it and work around it and still treat this person uh, uh successfully so um i'm off on a tangent here but the reason i'm saying this is uh one of the things you can do is seek out counseling help from people like you and me but there are lots of other things you can do to help yourself uh, regain functioning, uh, even just a little bit, um, whether uh, whether it's a meditative practice, whether it's running, uh, uh, Tai Chi, uh, yoga. Um, you know, some people like to drag race. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Other than because it's going to generate the same kind of fear within you that the media would. Um, but I could see maybe for the outlying person here that, that that might be their thing, you know, or bungee jumping or something like that. Um, ways to separate yourself from the overarching cultural umbrella raining these ideas down on us. Yeah. Um, you know, hiking, um, other things, you know, things like that. And so so design. Try, try and figure out ways to get distance from it and then to uh, introspect, to figure out ways, what what am I, 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 personally, I love meditation because the idea of focusing on my five senses one at a time, along with, you know, visceral feelings or uh, one practice I, I like and I, I prescribe sometimes for clients is because thoughts are always interjecting while we're in meditation. Hey, don't forget to take out the trash. You know, um, uh, don't don't forget to call your brother at five o'clock this afternoon. Um, uh, or or a thought of isn't isn't it awful what's happening five thousand miles away? Um, visualize the thought. My, I'll ask my clients to actually take that thought and visualize it in a way that works for you. Frequently, it's a it's a cloud a thought bubble for uh, personally i like uh, tubes coming out of my head oh there's that thought you know <laughs> um uh, but there's all kinds of different ways to just the act of visualizing with a label call your brother thought um lets you step back from it lets you go oh yeah okay i've got a little distance from that now now i can now i can do a little more introspection and uh, so there's lots of different practices that we can all do. And I'm, I'm sure you use them um, in your interventions uh, the way I do. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's it's really about about 
bringing us back to ourselves, our capital yes. S selves. Yes. Right? Yes. And so, and so that leads me to the next question, which is, and, and I can hear, it's like when I do these interviews, I can hear the listeners going, wait, wait, ask this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the listeners are asking, how can you be socially conscious? How can I care about the, the troubles in the Middle East with, you know, and how do I care about that while still being in a state of self-preservation and self self soothe and and com like aren't i supposed to be doing something right and so and that's what this this um amped up fear thing right everything is apocalyptic nothing is true and then as you so beautifully pointed out guess what folks this is what contributes to adhd this is what contributes to anxiety dep anxiety especially depression you know anxiety being a physiological state that's right. That's right. It's a visceral state. It's your bones, muscles, and guts saying danger right outside danger. Right. <laughs> so many people think anxiety is here. Right. But it is right. not. It's right. that's the that's the you know that's the one who gets the message from the body yeah. going yeah. holy crap you know we're right. we're right. right so um and so a lot of what we what I'm sure you are working with 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 clients and certainly what I'm working with um the rapid thinking, the, the, um, the fatigue, uh, gosh, so much fatigue, uh, the helplessness, the hopelessness, imposter syndrome, comparison traps, all of these things feed into what I call, a, a the lack of a foundation of self, right? The capital S self. So how do we stay socially conscious? How do we, how do we bring the grounded self into the collective? Because the we are meant to be working together as you know in in humanity the collective the collective right but like i submit to the, to the people i talk to that um we have to have we have to be on our own path of self awareness first you know uh, be so that we are bringing to the collective something that is not perfect, not fully self-actualized, because good luck. I hope you get there. Well, we're all trying, but that we're doing this inner work, that we're not spiritually bypassing, that we're not um we're not not looking at our trauma, that we're sitting with it, but we're not living at it either. We're not living our diagnosis, we're not labeling ourselves, putting more pressure on ourselves. It's exhausting, right? right. You have the weight of the world and the weight of the self on you. Your, right, your so words were not spiritually bypassing. I really like that. Um, uh, so I, I, again, going back to the systems around us, and I'm talking about historical systems. Um, yeah, we tend to go, mammalian thinking tends to be danger, yes, nurturance, yes. Which one do I turn to? As opposed to the huge gray spectrum in between. Might be a little dangerous, but I could go towards that. Um, uh, so, so the idea of not what it what the bombardment does is it generates black and white thinking. I have to be active right now. I have to go out and do this. Um, but in fact, studying the history of the systems. Uh, the, the the history um nuanced history of the the systems around us is really really important um because that's another way in my opinion an important way to to be able to step back and say yeah this bad stuff is happening whether it's uh wealth disparity middle east uh you know homelessness uh this bad stuff is happening um, and I have to do something, it may be much more advisable to study it first. Where did homelessness come from? In in my opinion, it comes from wealth disparity. And there's, but there's a, a thousand systems that, that played into that, or a hundred anyway. And, and, and so come to understand those systems before, um, having a, a black and white, you know, response to I know the answer and this is it, you know, um, type thing. So, so, um, 
uh, just as a little digression here, you were talking about the the authentic self. Um, I'm a big fan of Richard Schwartz' internal family systems approach. Uh, the idea that um, that parts of us are activated uh, when we see, when we experience different social media stimuli or different urban environment stimuli. Um, parts of us are activated. Trying to get to know those parts um, and 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 not not to shut them down, to listen to them. Thank you for advising me. Thank you for trying to protect me. Um, but I think I've got this. Um, one of my favorite questions that Schwartz suggested: <laughs> How how old do you think I am? Because frequently <laughs> the wounded part is going to say, "Oh, you're five. You're five years old. You haven't got a clue as to how to handle this." Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so um, getting to know your parts that are activated by these narratives, by the stimuli, um, is really important. Now. Uh, Schwartz has written a great book called No Bad Parts, which is a good way to start. Uh, but therapists, many of us therapists also have an approach that uses that or Jungian or voice dialogue. They're all valid um, to 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 get activated, wounded parts talking to the self, listening to them. Um, the self ultimately, as you as I think we might agree, it knows what we need if we can get the activated parts away from the driver's seat. The self can the self can begin to say, okay, I hear your concerns, but it might be safer to do it this way. Um uh and so um and and the and approaching um our internal parts this way, I think is actually. Um, very important uh, that that the idea that we are a single entity is fallacious. We're made up of a lot of parts with a self, with a a, a governing self in there, but the, the self is frequently taken over by wounded parts. Um, so so yeah, it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, and so that's that's the work. What I I want to repeat. Uh, something you said that I think is so helpful um, that in the direct answer to how do I do both? How do I be socially conscious and do my inner self work? I love what you said, you know, do some research. Don't go into full battle mode, right? <laughs> like right, you know, rushing the battle. I know it like, like you said, you know, I know what the answer is. This is how we do it. Instead. Yeah. That is how you learn. That is, and and as you're learning about wealth disparity, as you're learning about racism in America, for example, um, letting those parts sit with you at the table and learn too, right? Listen to what comes up for you, right? You know, right. whether no matter what color or gender you are, this is. Um, this is important. Listen to what comes up. Have that dialogue with yourself and yes. your your existing beliefs that does this serve me anymore? Right, right. And is and this something, society? Yeah, go ahead. Something you mentioned earlier, uh, multi-generational trauma, because we are going to have wounded parts from traumas that our parents and grandparents and great grandparents experienced. And and uh they're going to advise us those parts. They're gonna tell us. Um, possibly in a fight or flight way, what to do. Um, and and it's fine. Talk to them. Don't shame them. Don't push them away. Talk to them. Let them advise you. But ultimately, seek out um, a, a well-researched, well-balanced um, approach as you take their advice or yeah. not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, right. And that's that's Checking. And then this is, again, somatic work. Check with the body. How do you feel when you're presented with a certain piece of information? Are you yeah. going into fight or flight or are you in, you know, in a relaxing state or an open, I call it an open state. Oh, sure. all right, more. Let me give, you know, then we'll go in that direction. 
Beautiful. Um, I could talk about this for hours, but we do have to close for this session. I hope you'll come back because this is such a wonderful conversation to have. Sure, um, I'd, I'd be honored. I'd love to come back and talk yeah. to you some more rituals. Um, so how can people find you, Kent? Um, easiest way is my website, kentw.net. Kentw.net um, uh, is a little stuff about my background, but more importantly, my book, Stop Breaking Down, The Secret to Avoiding Overwhelming Crack Up, um, which talks a lot about uh, the things we have spent time uh, today talking about, uh, as well as other uh, systemic approaches to uh to coping and 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 healing uh from the onslaught that we're all under experiencing right now beautiful and i will have those links in the show notes um there i think you're also on linkedin i think you sent me that link as well so i'll put all that all right. in uh i'll put that in the show notes um Kent Weishouse, thank you so much for being with us on Self Talk today. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, this is Rachel Astarte from the Self Talk podcast. I'd love for you to send me your emails with questions or stories about yourself. What are you looking for? What are your questions? What what are you grappling with in your own personal life that has to do with your identity, with yourself, with your very existence? These are the things that we're going to talk about during the podcast. And go ahead. It's all right. Get deep. I can handle it. So send them to Rachel at selftalkpodcast.com. And I'll see you on the next episode.